Previously, we looked at the invasion of Israel by a coalition of nations led by Gog of Magog. Let's recap. As to when will this invasion take place? This invasion is prophesied to occur after many days, that is, after a considerable period, essentially, after a long passage of time. It will take place in the latter years, in the last days. Marking the culmination of history, the final era of the future. Additional signs include the restoration of the land following the devastation of wars and the regathering of Israel from numerous nations. What are the conditions in Israel before the invasion? Previously, the land was in a state of perpetual desolation due to the ravages of war. However, it has now been rejuvenated. The people had been gathered from various nations. They reside in tranquility, securely dwelling in villages devoid of walls, barricades, and gates. In 1948, around 2% of Israel's land was covered in trees, a figure that has since increased to approximately 8.5%. Over the course of the 20th century, roughly 250 million trees have been planted across Israel, making it the only country in the world to end the century with more trees than it had in 1900. Despite these reforestation efforts, sizable expanse of wilderness remains in Israel today. The land is still far from resembling the Garden of Eden as prophesied in Ezekiel 36 verse 35. Regarding demographics, in 1948, the Jewish population of the newly formed state was approximately 650,000. By 2024, Israel had become home to the largest Jewish population globally, exceeding 6.9 million. This substantial increase reflects both natural growth and immigration from various parts of the world. Nevertheless, an estimated 8 to 9 million Jews still reside outside of Israel. What about in the area of security? Are the Jews in Israel living securely in unwalled villages? In 1967, Israel, Egypt, Jordan, and Syria engaged in a military conflict known as the Six Day War. Prior to this conflict, the Gaza Strip was under Egypt's control, while the West Bank was administered by Jordan. Following the Six-Day War, Israel gained control over both the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. Today, numerous walls and fences exist to separate areas under Palestinian Authority from those under Israeli control. These barriers, constructed by Israel for security reasons, have led to a significant physical division between Palestinian territories and Israeli administered areas. This picture depicts the West Bank, which is partitioned into three distinct areas labeled A, B, and C, each subject to varying degrees of Palestinian and Israeli authority. Area C, constituting the largest portion of the West Bank, falls entirely under Israeli control. The proliferation of Israeli settlements within Area C further complicates the geopolitical landscape of the Middle East and poses challenges to the realization of a viable Palestinian state in the future. Russia's annexation of Crimea and subsequent invasion of Ukraine have raised concerns about its continued aggressive actions in the region. Turkey lies south of Ukraine. And below Turkey is Syria. Russia has been a key supporter of President Bashar al-Assad of Syria since the onset of the Syrian civil war, providing arms and equipment to the Assad regime. The supply of advanced weaponry has significantly bolstering Assad's military capabilities. 
In 2015, Russia intervened in the conflict by conducting extensive airstrikes on opposition strongholds. Russia's military support and involvement in Syria has led to concerns for Israel regarding potential escalations along the Syrian-Israeli border and in the region. Iran was the second Muslim-majority country to recognize Israel as a sovereign state after Turkey. But following the Iranian Revolution in 1979, Iran adopted an anti-Israel stance, severing all official relations with Israel. In December 2000, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei famously referred to Israel as a cancerous tumor that should be removed from the region. Iran is also known to support Hamas and Hezbollah with arms, training, and financial assistance. These two organizations are designated as terrorist organizations and are sworn enemies of Israel. It appears that the circumstances preceding the war do not align with the current situation. The key condition mentioned in Ezekiel's prophecy is the people living securely in the land. It is emphasized in verses 8, 11, and 14. Related terms include people at rest, living without walls, and having no bars or gates. This assurance of security was part of the covenant of peace outlined in Ezekiel 34 verse 25 and Ezekiel 37 verse 26. According to this interpretation, the invasion by Gog and his allies would occur after the establishment of the peace covenant. After the return of the Messiah. In Ezekiel 34 verses 23 to 25, God promised to appoint David to be their good shepherd. And when David comes, he will enter into a covenant of peace with the people. Historically, Israel has yet to enjoy such an idyllic situation of living securely since she returned from Babylon in 539 BC. It seems plausible, therefore, to suggest that Ezekiel here has in view a coming future golden age. Can the context of Ezekiel 38-39 shed light on the timing of the war? In chapter 33, Israel's exile and loss of their land due to disobedience to the Mosaic Covenant are recounted. However, in chapter 34, God promised to appoint the Messiah to shepherd them in the land. In chapter 35, God pledges to remove foreign oppressors and those who claim the land illegitimately. Chapters 36 to 37 describe the restoration of the land and the people being empowered by the Spirit to obey God's laws. Additionally, Chapter 37 vividly assures the reunion and regathering of the two nations back to the land. Subsequently, in chapters 38 to 39, the exiles are informed of the impending war. The context strongly suggests that the war depicted in Ezekiel 38 to 39 transpires during the end times, when Israel has been reinstated in the land, when the Messiah is present and when Israel's covenantal promises are fulfilled. When do you anticipate the Messiah's return? This diagram outlines my understanding of the timing and sequence of events leading to the end times. Initially, Christ, the Messiah, will return together his church, both the living and the dead, bringing them to heaven. Following this event, a period of seven years of intense tribulation will ensue. And after this tribulation period, Christ will come physically on earth to defeat the Antichrist in the decisive battle of Armageddon. Initiating his thousand-year reign on earth over the nations, known as the Millennial Kingdom. Upon the culmination of the thousand years, Satan, who was previously restrained during Christ's earthly reign, will be released, prompting deception among the nations. 
and the formation of an army. Rallying against God in the final battle of Gog and Magog. This confrontation will result in the judgment of the wicked and Satan. Consequently, the righteous will transition into the eternal state in the new heavens and new earth. According to my interpretation, the invasion, led by Gog and his allies, is scheduled to occur after the Messiah's return. Following Christ's return, two significant battles are anticipated. The Battle of Armageddon and the Battle of Gog and Magog. Is the war described in Ezekiel 38-39 synonymous with one of these battles? Or does it represent a distinct conflict? The war described in Ezekiel 38-39 and the Battle of Armageddon exhibit several parallels. Gathering of Nations Against Israel In both passages, there is a gathering of nations to make war. Ezekiel describes Gog and his allies assembling to invade Israel, Ezekiel 38 verses 2 to 6. While Revelation depicts the nations being gathered by demonic spirits to the place called Armageddon for battle against the returning Christ. Supernatural Intervention Both passages include supernatural elements accompanying the conflicts. In Ezekiel, there are earthquake, hailstones, fire and brimstones, Ezekiel 39 verses 19 to 22. Likewise, in Revelation, there are earthquakes and hailstones. Poured out in the last seventh bowl judgment, Revelation 16 verses 17 to 21, before the coming of Christ, Revelation 16 verses 17 to 21. Aftermath of the battle. In Ezekiel, the corpses of the defeated armies become food for birds and beasts, Ezekiel 39 verses 17 to 21. While in Revelation 19 verses 17 to 18, 21, only the birds are invited to feast on the corpses. The war described in Ezekiel 38 to 39 and the battle depicted in Revelation 20 verses 7 to 10 exhibit parallels. Gog and Magog In both passages, there is a reference to Gog and Magog. In Revelation 20 verses 7 to 10, Gog and Magog symbolize the gathering of nations from the four corners of the earth to surround the camp of the saints and the beloved city, Jerusalem. Likewise, in Ezekiel 38 to 39, Gog from the land of Magog leads a coalition of nations in an invasion against Israel. This alliance comprises nations from all directions of the compass. From the north, there are Rosh, identified with modern-day Russia, along with Goma and Bethtagama, representing present-day Turkey. From the east, there is Persia, corresponding to modern Iran. From the south, there is Kush, referring to northern Sudan. And from the west, there is Put, signifying modern Libya. Supernatural Intervention in Ezekiel 38 verses 18 to 23, the invaders are destroyed supernaturally by God with fire and sulfur. Similarly, in Revelation 20 verse 9, fire comes down from heaven and devours the armies of Gog and Magog, demonstrating God's sovereignty and justice. While there are similarities between the war in Ezekiel, 38 to 39 and the two battles in Revelation. They are also distinct in certain aspects, such as the timing and sequence of events, the identities of the participants, and the ultimate outcome. Take a moment to compare these three wars. There are many views as to the timing of this future invasion. Let's examine one viewpoint that I find coherent and minimally problematic. 
Ezekiel 38-39 portrays what appears to be two wars, but is perceived as a single event. The first conflict occurs at the end of the tribulation period, while the second battle unfolds at the conclusion of the millennium, a time when the people are dwelling securely in the land of Israel. These two conflicts are separated by a span of 1,000 years. A prophet, when granted a vision of future events, may see them as one. Just like observing two towering mountain peaks in the distance. However, in reality, these events are separated by a valley of time. A temporal interval lying between the fulfillment of the two parts of the prophecy. We have a good example in the two events of the Messiah, where two events are viewed as one. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness, from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. The prophet Isaiah looked beyond the birth of the Messiah to his second coming, when the Messiah will reign in righteousness and justice from the throne of David. What message does Ezekiel 38 to 39 convey to the exiles? In Ezekiel 34, God pledges to establish a covenant of peace with his people, ensuring their secure dwelling in the land. If God is for us, then who can be against us? This sentiment holds true for Israel, particularly against Gog and his allies. The deliverance from Gog's attack shows God's faithfulness in upholding the peace covenant. With the inauguration of this covenant, Jerusalem will never fall again.